Fellows there, a uh, very good evening and welcome to Let's Talk Politics. I'm your host, Eddie Lane, and of course, as we always say, this program is dedicated to examining and to bring to you the progress taking place under the People's Progressive Party civic government for the last 10, uh, well, the last 11 months or so since we would have taken office. Also, uh, we will dedicate some time to address the misinformation, lies, and racist rhetoric coming from the opposition AP and UAFC. So, as usual, you know, my Saturday night guest is usually uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament and my friend Sanjeev Dattin. And Sanjeev, it's always a pleasure, man. Ed, uh, good evening to your viewers and listeners, and of course to you as well. And it's always a pleasure to be here um, uh, for this program. Um, so, Let's get the show on the road. Certainly. Um, and I want to start, I want to spend some time tonight to talk because I think, I, I, I feel guilty that we are not spending enough time to talking, um, spending enough time talking about what we've been doing as a government and the positive impact the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration would have had on Guyanese both at home and abroad. And I want to start with some focus on the confidence that uh, foreign investors and investors generally are showing um, in Guyana, despite us being in a COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen tremendous response from uh, investors, both locally and abroad. A lot of people were holding back their investments um, over the last, well, the, the five years of the AP and UAFC because of the uncertainty that existed, because of uh, the dictatorial tendencies of that administration and because of the fact that that administration lacked simple vision, vision for development, vision of how they can create wealth for people, for communities and for regions. You had a bunch of people who were busy running all over the place, thinking about how they can fill their pockets rather than focusing on a strategic developmental agenda for Guyana, which has, which would have, would have uh, produced tremendous benefit for the people. Since August 2nd last year, um, when the PVPC took office, there has been a complete shift. Hope has returned to Guyana. People have more confidence in government. They have confidence in the economy. Investors are, are lining up to come here. And I think people are progressing individually um, as communities, as regions, and the country as a whole. And I want, Sanjeev, I say all of that to maybe single out mo the most recent investment that has come to Guyana. And I saw you uh, participated in that sort of turning yesterday for the courtyard by Marriott at the Chedi Jagan International Airport. This is a massive investment. And this is just one in many investments of this nature that are taking place. This is a demonstration of confidence in an economy and confidence in a government. Ed, yes. Um... I was fortunate enough to be yesterday at the uh, sod turning ceremony for the courtyard by Marriott that is going to be uh, built at the airport. I was there. Uh, I'm chairman of the Cherry Jagan International Airport. Uh, the, so as a result of that, I was present. But I I think we have to look at the, the scheme a little bit um, wider if you look at that. As soon as uh, the Irfan Ali-led administration came into government, shortly after, there was the invitation for persons who wished to build hotels in Guyana and what they were going to, and for them to put in their proposals of what they wanted to do. Um, that followed shortly with the announcement that there were about 11, and eventually I believe it was 13, um, projects were approved by the government and the government gave their blessing to say, go ahead and do your construction. We've already had the, the Arimu, um, one that is in, uh, on Rob street, but, um, Geraldo and Lorenzo Alfonso, they're involved in that and they've already start putting piles in the ground and the construction on that has started, which shows the confidence they have in how quickly that was done. We have also Mr. Basu and his family, which was what yesterday's saw turning under the, um, the vehicle Ford project is known as Cardinal Investments. And the Marriott 
that we are going to have the courtyard by Marriott that is going to be at the at the airport is the second Marriott, of course, in Ghana. We all know that there is another Marriott, but the success of that Marriott and the I mean, when that Marriott was first built, there was such criticism. But the success of that Marriott has is is demonstrated by the fact that Marriott is prepared to put a second hotel uh, in Guyana. This one is is piloted by the Basu family, and they have worked very hard. I know how many um, challenges and hurdles they needed to have resolved. Uh, they had to have uh, uh, discussions with the airport. They had to have clearances for various things. And they worked very hard and very diligently in getting it done. As a result, now, that project, the turning of the sod that has gone on there, that is a multi, multi-billion dollar investment in Guyana dollars. And it is going to be uh, operational. It will save us so much in terms of having an airport there, which means flight crews can stay there. The convenience when we have, unfortunately, delayed flights for weather, for other reasons, there are now going to be facilities at the airport that can cater to that. It was important. Um, President Irfan Ali was, was very clear that what this is, is a part of a larger project. There's a hotel that is going to go at the airport. There is it is his intention to have uh, facilities for craft shops to be located near to the airport um, so that they are available to, to travelers. There is the intention of putting a super highway, a whole road system that moves away from the East Bank roads that are in existence that are a little bit more congested and their roads. We all know that there are roads that are already going from Mandela to Eccles. Um, there's a second project from Eccles to Diamond that should be on the way shortly. And then it's to go um, further afield. So not only are we going to the Silica City, the president has spoken about that frequently and the benefits that could be had with it. And he's outlined, this is, this is one little part of a bigger vision of how we're going to be able to realign our economy to take advantage of things that would be uh, beneficial to our people. But this is not only about uh, multi-million dollar investments, the craft shops, the stores, and, and the president was at pains yesterday to point out that those are integral parts of the development project. The, the training of people for the hospitality sector so that with their training they will they will have a certificate and certif the certification will mean that their earning capacity is improved and their ability to look after their families are improved and the craft shop to be able to be located close to the airport without having to the the substantial investment of building a place or the high rents because this is going to be a government um owned property so that the high rents that they would usually be made to pay if they were to be engaged in that. These are all things that form and then the communication, the road coming with it so that people can easily get up there. The hotel that is going to be built, that is, that sh the, the, the hotel, Ed, don't, don't make no mistake. No one will invest millions of dollars in a project in an economy or or under the stewardship the leadership of a government where there is no confidence in them they will only put their money where they have good or or good confidence in the returns they will get but also the environment in which they're investing so this hotel is a great indication of that there are other development plans around the airport, around the issues that will be going on. And this is going to be crucial going forward. We also have to, to bear in mind that we can't only be focused on the big investment and we can't only be focused on the big multi-million dollar projects. And President Ali was at pains yesterday to point out that that is not the intention. That is not what's going to happen. They will 
the government will assist those of the smaller businesses, the arts and craft businesses, and all those other uh, institutions uh, and businesses that would like to benefit and would benefit from being placed near to the airport to do so. So it's an exciting project and it bodes well for the country. I'm happy, I'm happy Sanjeev, you raise the point of, of the government not having a vision of, of, of just the, the major projects. While having that, that big um, outlook um, to have to bring investments that will create significant returns, whether uh, job creation, revenue for the country and so on. The fact that they, as a government, we, I think we're able to create that balance. And this is because of experience this is because of knowledge and this is because of our, an understanding of what is needed to really move a country forward and that is why that balance is able to be created so while you're focusing on the large industries the, the large investments there is also um, simultaneous kind of focus on developing the small and medium scale enterprises to ensure that they benefit from opportunities to ensure that they grow because those are also creating employment opportunities. Those are also making contributions to the economy. And significantly in all of this, while all of this happening in terms of the investments, there is also heavy focus on diversifying the other sectors of our economy, um, including the agriculture sector, the mining sector. So it is really a, no sector in this country is really operating or the growth in this country is not taking place in in any silo it's totally integrated and and uh, again it is because of the vision so what happened uh, and you would recall sanjeev when the first announcement of oil was made uh, after the 2015 elections when the apnu took power they abandoned everything else and it was about oil so they had no interest in agriculture they had no interest in mining they had no interest in forestry they weren't focusing on the manufacturing sector. They weren't focusing on the services sector. Everything, the tourism sector, they abandoned everything else. And they thought that oil was the answer to the country. And I think that is what placed us in a really, really serious position when we took office on August 2nd. Because you had most of the sectors that were broken. And even the oil sector, where they were placing all the emphasis, they, 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 they didn't even strike a good deal for us, you know, so that we can actually benefit um the maximum from the sector so they were focused on the 18 million us that they collected that they were hiding and they were focusing they were going borrowing money all over the place borrowing against monies that they didn't have which is they were banking on the oil revenues of 2021 of this year and since 2015 2016 they're about they were borrowing based on the revenue that we were getting. And this is the typical mismanagement that you talk about. You know, you have your home, you know you're working $100 per week, but you are taking credit and you are buying $200 worth with the hope you will get a salary increase sometime in the future at the workplace. And that is the kind of, of management you were seeing. So those though they put us into some serious problems we were managed to as a country we we're gradually managing as a government to overcome those and to really right the economy to set things back on stream and i think and and, and i think the, the the fact that we are focusing sanjeev on a more integrated economic approach where there is a diversification there is focus on all the sectors it is really putting Guyana in a position that we not suffer from what many oil producing nations would have suffered from. That is the Dutch disease, where all the hope and emphasis was on one sector and you abandon and you neglect other sectors. And if we look across the border, no offense to the Trinidadians, but they have all, almost found themselves in a similar position of the Dutch disease, where all the emphasis, most of the revenue was coming from really the, the oil and gas industry. And that industry is, is taking a beating and the country is in, in, in absolute chaos financially. Yeah, you see the attraction is because this is your greatest earner in, in, in the immediate uh, term. The attraction is, is to take, put everything towards generating as much as you can in that sector. 
But by doing that, you're neglecting the other sector, the other businesses, the other opportunities, the sugar, the rice, the, uh, the other far farming, the smaller scale farming, fish, uh, fishing, uh, the seafood, um, ecotourism, all of these things are also generators of income. They, they, we, you can't only gear towards one side because when the oil production is reduced or when the oil prices fall, you have no other leg to stand on. And that's what um, is happening. You could, you, you know, you expect in a growing economy, you're going to have more hotels, you're going to have more world-class hotels. So yesterday's event was um, with the Marriott brand who are well known around the world and they're very stringent, they're very strict as to what you have to do. And they would not be involved unless there was uh, certainty in what would be achieved. The previous one, which is what I mentioned with the RMO investment, their Best Western, which is another well-known uh, American chain of hotels. So, and there, I mean, we've been told others are in the process and are being finalized, but these two are actually turning sod. So, which means they're, their ducks are in a row, they're lined up to what they're going to do and they're, they're about to, they've um, already taken off. So usually in about a year, 18 months, two years, these projects would usually take and that would be the end of it. So there's confidence again, but there's confidence because we're not only going to be poor, putting all our eggs in one basket, we're going to be doing it in a more diversified way, which gives greater certainty and safety. Certainty for the economists and the, the people who count the monies and the, um, I'm sure Dr. Ashley Singh is very happy and with, with that, but safety for those of the people who live in the country, the safety that we don't have everything hinging on one um, source of income. We must have as many as possible so that we are not dependent on anyone because we all know oil wouldn't last forever. Um, but agriculture and other things like that would have a much longer life. And, and Sanjeev, you know, when you look, um, it all fits into, and I want to switch to maybe His Excellency's um, address yesterday. So um, the town hall meeting in, um, in New York, Richmond Hill, New York, organized by the International Center for Democracy there. Um, the president addressed that meeting virtually, and he spoke about a number of things. He spoke about the significant investments that are being made by the, by the private sector. He spoke about the diversification of, um, of, of the, 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 the economy. And chief among them, for example, he spoke about, about 40 projects that have been approved, and I think you mentioned them just now, um, for manufacturing and fabrication, including the, the cement plant, um, asphalt plant, uh, large-scale farms, agro-processing facilities, a, a milk plant, um, juice plant, and the soya bean and corn production. The president himself shared some photos, rather, um, of that. Uh, the needs in the poultry sector and, and the investments that are going to come there, um, and you know, and the list goes on. The fact of the matter is, Sanjeev, is that this is a demonstration of the plans, the, 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 the significant amount of plans this government um, would have had already in train to boost the economy, to create jobs. I haven't touched the housing sector. I haven't touched the construction sector. I haven't touched um, the, the ICT sector. But those are all additional areas through which employment will be created, wealth will be generated, and our population will become much richer individually as citizens and as a nation. But when you see, and, and this is the second engagement really with the diaspora, there was a huge diaspora conference, which I was privileged to be one of the local organizers um, participated in planning that conference through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And even before we went to the conference, Sanjeev, I, could have, I, I can say to you that 
the, 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 the representatives in the diaspora, diverse group of people from all across the world where Guyanese have a presence, they were excited about the opportunities that existed in Guyana. Because I shared a couple of videos that we did, investment-related and um, infrastructure-related video that we did, and I shared it with them. And they were excited to see what was happening, the plans, and to listen to the plans that the government of Guyana, the PPPC government has. And when His Excellency and the Vice President and the, the other ministers, Minister Ashni Singh and the others participated in that conference, they can tell you that it was very, very dynamic. Uh, the interest was very high. And you only have that happening when people have confidence. Our citizens who live in America and who live in, 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 in the UK and other places won't want to abandon or to come back and invest in Guyana if they don't have confidence in the, in, in the government and they don't see growth and they don't see opportunities exist in the economy. And I can go and talk about the, the, the heavy tax burden that we removed when we took office uh, to ensure that we bring relief to people, not to, to the investors, but to the average citizen. Removing VAT from water and electricity and, and, and basic health care and from simple things like data and so forth, we're all creating wealth. We're opportunities to create wealth for people because individuals having more monies in their pocket, more disposable income that they can use for different, different things and put back into the economy and help to grow the country. So the vision of the government is clear. And I think the interest of not just locals, not just Guyanese living overseas, but investors both in Guyana, US based and, 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 and uh, Guyanese based in other parts of the world, and the foreign investors themselves are all flocking to come to Guyana because of the tremendous opportunities that are created and are being created by this government in almost every sector in order to grow our country. Well, yes, today, um, the, at the same conference that you were speaking of in, in New York, where the president spoke, I thought it was a great use of the event by his excellency that we've been uh he's been in office but his the administration we've been in power now for a few months it's great to always hear what's going on what opportunities exist they were they were very important things however that his excellency emphasized he emphasized all the various projects that have been that have come yesterday at the sod turning uh, the president said very clearly, he says, if you have a project and come knocking on our door, if you have a proposal and you have worked out what you want to do, come knocking on our door because Guyana is interested in development and moving forward. And the range of projects that uh, His Excellency highlighted yesterday to the diaspora is as wide as you could ever imagine i mean honestly speaking when i was looking at it i did not know that so much uh, was going on going on across so many sectors um the construction sector is obviously important but the soil which is the agriculture the the um the cement which relates to construction the asphalt is for the roads every sector you can imagine Guyana has been moving and we have to be careful as the president said yesterday at the sod turning that we got to make sure the economy don't overheat and inflation gets out of hand but that's a part of what management is it's a good place to be that you have so many things that you have to figure out how to slow things down and to um to control growth so that there is not inflation but make no mistake about it ed those in the diaspora are very interested in what goes on at home they're very interested to know that guyana is moving forward and most of them at least from the engagements i have whether it's from facebook messages or, or text messages that come that come to me most people want to be involved and they want to participate in what's going on in guyana because they see the opportunity that they might be able to come to Guyana and to contribute to its development and also earn a living for themselves. 
and they they now it, it, it was a great uh the event was was great at getting the information out to so many people that look this is what's going on and this is how you can contribute whether you want to come to work or whether you want to come to have your own business or you want to partner with someone to do your own business you can consider doing it and the environment for that is now set the vision of the development was outlined in great detail by the president and those are things that the people in the diaspora they need feedback and they need to hear it was a great opportunity and i believe the point was well made um but you see the diaspora has had been previously cut off or or you didn't see very much engagement from the diaspora in the last administration except perhaps to raise money when money was required um uh, money is always required in political parties and campaigning, but you didn't see any sort of involvement with them except for those things. At least as far as I was aware, that was the only time that I saw that they were events. They were really fundraising events. This was more of an informative educational event so that people across the board can come, across, can come to know what opportunities exist and what's going on. But then we have the other side of it. The president last night, I thought, made, uh, if I say so uh, humbly, a very telling statement that he's prepared to engage with anyone. He's prepared to meet with the opposition or whatever it is that they label they wish to need. But they must respect the will of the Guyanese people at the last election. And they must recognize that the people of Guyana elected the PPPC uh, and as a result, the Irfan Ali led administration. They must be, you, you have to recognize them. The opposition keep playing games and going around in circles. Um, they want better engagement. They want to be involved in what's going on, but you don't want to, to respect the will of the people. You're going to meet someone and you're going to meet the man who is the president of the country but you don't want to acknowledge that he is the president of the country. So who are you going to meet? And why are you going, why should he meet with you to exchange ideas in what capacity? No president, no president could reasonably be expected to countenance that. And I think uh, President Ali made a very, very clear and telling statement. We are prepared to engage with everyone. The president has said he personally is prepared to engage with everyone, but he will not engage when the opposition are only interested in the name calling and the various things that go with it. And I, I, I can see the value and wisdom of that. And I think every reasonable person can see the value and wisdom of that, that what is what is the, the contention is you must have, you must recognize persons for who they are and the office for which they hold. You can't continue with this childish thing and expect to get anywhere. And that too indicates the position of his excellency for movement and growth. He is prepared to, to engage all. And of course we have the converse side of it where we have this, this fella that um, keeps he lives in New York keeps saying all these things, and I don't know where he gets these ridiculous facts and ideas. Um, he has claimed that he's a lawyer. Uh, I don't know that he's a lawyer in Guyana, at least. But and then he supposedly organized this massive protest, and he said that you know there are thousands of people who he speaks to on every show and what he does and he does not do and how popular he was. Um, yesterday, the Attorney General, upon arriving at that um, event and upon being at that event, I had a few short words with him. I think he turned his phone around to show me what was going on and I, I didn't believe. I thought that was the regular traffic on the street in New York outside for where he was saying that. <laughs> 
and I was and I kept mentioning to the attorney general, Matt, you, you got to put the camera. But he says, no, that's it. And he even took a picture and sent it to me. And and Ed, I will tell you this. Everybody in Guyana has been to New York at some point in time. And you know that it could be a fairly busy place. I have seen more people traversing those streets in their daily business and walking around. More people than they were standing at what he termed the protest. Most I rather suspect more they, most of them were just lockdown. walking past. Yeah, yeah more people. Lockdown, you had more people walk more than yesterday. That's the name. I, I, I was not remembering the name as I was speaking. Mr. Uh, the gentleman's name is Mr. Burke. But now, Mr. Burke is, is, is he claims this great thing, and, and, and that was insignificant. And his views, his 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 views of hatred and division and race, are insignificant, and that demonstrates that people are not taking him seriously, and quite rightly so. They are they are recognizing that Guyana now has a vision, the vision of the the, the president and the vice president, and the administration is seeping through. Um, further and further and people are realizing this is the grand vision and this is what will be going on and people are now motivated mobilizing they want to get involved they want to contribute they want to grow their businesses um, the ministry of housing just by a cursory look at, uh, on facebook of at the pages of the two ministers in the ministry of uh, of housing i don't know how they find the hours to do the work that they're doing if you look continuously as to um uh minister kroll is always uh meeting with persons trying to resolve so is minister rodriguez minister kroll is always in the interior locations helping with the the flood relief and the distribution of assistance and so is minister rodriguez and then they're in Essequibo dealing with the issue of house lots and then they're back in georgetown dealing with the issue of house lots then they're uh, in region three dealing with it is it is very very I, f I i could tell you that from when i see that i i feel that very invigorated that they are so motivated to give so much and to work so hard to make sure that that housing is better in in guyana and the house lot issue which is a sore issue is now more or less getting to be um, more streamlined and it appears to be more effective and what is going on and the development that has been um, following is is also something that is not to be taken lightly it is indeed a, a substantial achievement but all of these things ed all of these things are coming across that the housing development, the construction that is going on, the road construction that is going on, the the big businesses, if we think of them as anchors, the bigger businesses are like the anchors, they pr provide employment, they build a community around them. And the big businesses, the bigger projects are happening with the wharfs, with the, the various um, sectors that are involved there. All of these things provide anchors to an economy. And then there is sugar, which was do which uh, from what has been published in the papers, sugar is doing better. Sugar is doing much better. Sugar is leading um, the way in terms of how to generate income so that they're paying off some of the old debts and they're they're even doing better. The rains might have thwarted much of it and, and they might have been because of the flooding. We might have some setbacks, but those things can't be helped at this stage. Um, and we must do. But the movement, the momentum on all fronts are, are, are moving. And Guyana is definitely on the move. And you can see a vision and you can see the parts of the vision coming to fruition. So it is the naysayers who are like Mr. Burke and, and attack people personally and in very derogatory terms about what he wants to respond to. And he goes on and on and harping about this and harping about that and saying things for which he has no justification or proof in saying them. 
and he's been continuing to do that. And but you could see from what happened yesterday and what he promised would happen yesterday and his big group of supporters that he were going to bring that his foolishness is not getting any traction and the things he say and what he's preaching is not getting any traction and quite rightly so people are looking at reality rather than the man who's preaching fantasy and preaching nonsense but as you know, I won't spend too much time on on Richard Burke. I think the AG has uh, dealt with him. The Attorney General um, has been very clear. <laughs> I believe Richard Burke's um, intention is really to seek relevance. He has been crying in the wilderness for a while. No one have would have really focused on him. He call, he you know he always busy cussing down everybody and putting in 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 in, in local uh, term. But he's useless. Let's listen. Uh, yesterday is a clear demonstration that the Guyanese living in the diaspora are more more focused on the opportunities that exist in Guyana for them to come back to invest, maybe to build a home, to retire, and and you know and to contribute to the development of their country. They have no time with Rickford Borg running around uh, Queens with with five six people. And I saw someone labeled number the people in the thing twenty three uh, persons this big march that he organized you know um squaring up to fight with a with, with an elderly man and all sorts of things that's the kind of of of, of gutter behavior you're going to find coming from people like Richard Bork who have no relevance um so I won't spend much time on him I I would what I would do is encourage him to come back to Guyana um hopefully the police don't pick him up as the AG would have said and you know because of of, of all the the things that he probably would have done to people here who we owe and who we don't even owe. Um, so I won't spend much time on him. While he was busy outside going on with his, his, his um, circus, the AG was being, you know, honored by the New York City Council um, for preservation of democracy in Guyana. So that is of, of more significance to Rickford Bork. I want to touch because of time, Sanjeev, on a couple of other things. And um, one of them being uh, the efforts of the government to uh, continue, um, you know, and, and this is the important thing. And this is, again, where you would expect an opposition, a responsible opposition would want to play a role in helping to address a national issue, a global issue that is affecting Guyana. And that is the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we saw, we saw the government of Guyana receiving another 12,000 doses of, of, of vaccines. We have a large amount of vaccines here. And I saw the Minister of Health uh, assuring citizens that pretty soon, in a matter, um, in a very short period of time, the second dose of the Sputnik V will be here for those who would have already taken the first dose. So there is vaccine. The government of Ghana is moving forward with a program to vaccinate the people. I'll tell you what, our only way out of this pandemic is vaccination. COVID-19 is not going to go anywhere from us anytime soon unless we do the right things, not just in Guyana, but around the world, to, to prevent the virus from spreading. That is the first thing we have to do. And vaccination is seen as one way of protecting all of us so that we can return to some uh, level of normalcy. Take, for example, yesterday you saw pictures and videos in New York where people are without masks. That is because they're vaccinated. The economy in New York is able to reopen and the, 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 the state is really moving forward. That is what we have to look at. And the government of Ghana is making every effort. But what is even worse, um, what is really alarming, Sanjeev, I'm looking at an article here of the Minister of Health talking about, um, you know, overall, the total number of children is 1,500 children would have contracted the COVID-19 virus um, over the period this is a serious issue it is certainly um and then we're seeing i think there are reports that a couple of children are hospitalized and that they are a bit worse off um most of the children of the 1500 however have not really um you know been that ill in terms of when they contracted the virus but we're seeing a trend now based on what the minister of health would have said where a few children are getting uh, you know more sick as a result of the virus but what is heartwarming, what is satisfying, what is, is really 
you know bringing some 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 um comfort to the people is the the response of the government and his excellency made it clear yesterday that once we get the vaccines from the u.s i think it is the um moderna if i am correct the moderna bio uh the pfizer sorry the pfizer, pfizer vaccine that the pfizer bio BioNTech. once mm -hmm. we get that um he made it clear that it will go to children because that is what i think the u.s is using um to to vaccinate persons under 18 years so the government of ghana is making every effort to ensure too that we secure vaccines for the the, the people under 18 um so that we have a population that is almost fully vaccinated all of this happening while you have Harmon going to Bartika and going to other places and continue with his, his anti-vaccination campaign where he's continuing to to raise non-issues he's fabricating uh, controversies around the vaccine controversies that don't exist you know the, the number of countries that have been using Sputnik V successfully um, all the clinical studies that have proven um, so far that, that, that Sputnik V seems to be the most effective vaccine and still you have a guy who took Sputnik V running around the place like a madman spreading lies and misinformation trying to confuse people. Why can't Harmon rise to the occasion, prove that he's a leader? Because the fact of the matter is a lot of his supporters are the ones who are pushing back and not taking the vaccines. Any proper leader will not encourage his people not to protect themselves. What he will do is to really encourage them to ensure that they're protected. So supporters who are, who are being deterred from taking the vaccines by Harman need to question Harman, ask him why you took Sputnik V and why are you continuing with this pushback, with this anti-vaccination um, rhetoric that you're running around the place spreading. That is the kind of misinformation that, that we have going on. But while all of that is happening, uh, Sanjeev, the government of Guyana is continuing to invest in getting adequate vaccines in Guyana. And I want to encourage people to grab the opportunity to ensure that they are vaccinated because vaccines, uh, you know, is seen as the only thing that can pull, out, out, pull us out of this uh, pandemic. You see, um, this thing, we every week and every time I'm on and, and you're there, I know, to, you know, even every time you're on, we beg people, please get vaccinated for yourself, firstly, for your family, for your communities. Please, please, please. We are begging people to get vaccinated. We have to face the realities of, of Guyana and, and, and the realities of the pandemic in which we live. In Guyana, while there, there's a perception in people's head about the vaccines that come from North America, which is the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, Guyana, we we just weren't we just not able we don't have uh, all, like all of the developed countries we were not they're not able to acquire those vaccines readily we weren't able to get it the president has been pushing the minister of health has been pushing for us to get pfizer at some stage because all the vaccines around the world are approved for use people 18 years and above Pfizer is the one that, and I believe Moderna is as well, approved for use between 18 and 12 or 18 and 14. And then there are some that are being tested right now for even lower up to six years. Um, so there are those tests. So what happens is those under 18, there is no real vaccine that is available for them except for Pfizer and Moderna. And that brings it from 18 to 12. In some places, they're doing it a little younger. But those countries have supplied essentially the developed world. There's a lot of complaint. If you look at the international news, there's a lot of complaint about the unfair distribution of vaccines. It is what it is. But Guyana has done its very best to get a dose, sufficient doses of vaccines 
by a combination of AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and Sinopharm for all of the adult population in Guyana. So that's, that's very important because those are the ones that vaccines are available for. The president and the Minister of Health are pushing very hard to get Pfizer vaccines, but the president has made it clear no one above 18 will be offered the Pfizer vaccine. They are only doing it so they can start trying to get the younger, the, the children, the adolescents, get them vaccinated, which is right, which is fair. But the persons now who, for which we have Sputnik and Sinopharm and AstraZeneca, who don't want to get vaccinated and who are saying the ridiculous things of, it somebody's trying bill gates is trying to put a microchip in them um i can tell you honest to god if you say it out loud you realize how stupid it is then you say you you, you don't want to do it because it's the mark of of the beast or or, or the vaccines are, are to mark you well you you better off getting marked I'm not saying that this is the mark of the beast. Do not misinterpret that in any kind. But you're better off getting a mark from the vaccine than getting a mark from COVID because the COVID one will be on your grave. So you, you try, you, you got to realize what it is that your chances are. This is, this is what's reasonable in the circumstances. You hear about it, it, it will make your hair fall off. It will make your libido evaporate it will make your private parts fall off these things are not true millions of people have taken these hundreds of millions of people and it's not so and people have all the skepticism but what are you going to do with with the pandemic that you're in how are you going to get protection this is your best protection and you should take it and People are saying that they're not do, they, they didn't get around to it. They don't have time. They're not in. They they have doubts about it. They're worried about it. What what is the concept? What uh, what will they, it be required for them to feel confident? My advice is very simple: act on realistic information, not the Facebook doctors, not the Facebook professors. Not the people who just say things with conspiracy theories, because con no conspiracy theory, it'll go around in, in so much of a circle that it becomes stupid and it will never be answered to the satisfaction of the conspiracy theorists. So accept these limitations of where what the world is. Facebook has allowed people to have a voice, which is a good thing, but they're not experts. They're everyday people who have a voice about various things. And look at the great preponderance of evidence, of scientific evidence about the success of vaccines. And these vaccines are our only chance. And now that you've, we, we, as the, um, Dr. Frank Anthony, the Minister of Health has made very, very clear that he's very worried because four young children are now in, hospitalized with COVID. Previously, they would be infected and, and they would have no real uh, troubles. And in many cases, they were discovered by chance because other persons in the household had, um, so it wasn't really affected. But this virus is mutating. There are different variants. We all know of the Delta variant. This is the one from India. And we all know of the effect that it has had. And it's going to, it's spreading and it's spreading fast. It's affecting children too. But children depend on us, the adults, to be responsible, to do the responsible thing. Because if the adults got vaccinated and the adults would not, uh, the spread would slow. The effect of the virus would slow. So those that can't be vaccinated, which are really the children, they would be safer. So that's why you take it for yourself. You need to get vaccinated for yourself, but you do it for your community. You do it for the children in your home or the children in your street. This is why you have to do it. And this, there is no magic about it. The pandemic has got the world in a bind. And we have to look at what are the realistic options out. 
And the only way that these, these, the only realistic option we have out right now is vaccines. And you wear your mask, you wash your hands and you socially distance. You keep trying to keep yourself safe. So, because if you're safe, you're, the chances of you keeping those you love safe is greater. And that's what you should focus on. And, you know, the negative that, that happened, that where the story from, from the opposition leader changed so many times, and the stories changed, the questions changed to so many things. It, it did gain a great disservice because it put thoughts into people's heads that they shouldn't be vaccinated. And that, that wasn't right. The, the rate of vaccination, the government is putting every effort to get it to rise and to move forward. But that sort of negativity is very, very bad because what it does is it slows down the process when momentum and building momentum in a vaccination drive is so hard. And people need to understand. There is going to come a time, people should understand, when you will not be allowed to travel on an airplane without a vaccine two doses too. And vaccine passports are real. They are, a, a, honestly speaking, Ed, I think they will come into being because those, they're people who want to be sure that when they're in public spaces and when they're traveling on aircrafts and going to other countries, the people, the country wants to know before you arrive in their country that you have been vaccinated. They're entitled to do that. People want to say that you have the freedom to not be vaccinated. Yes, you do. You have the right not to be vaccinated. But you also have to recognize that the laws common in Guyana and across the globe allows restriction of travel for the spread of communicable diseases. And this is one. And governments are entitled they can't take the people who are in the country and, and exile them and throw them out, but they can say you can't come here and you can't come unless you've been vaccinated so that you're not bringing it to us. The same will happen in Guyana. The same is happening in places now where if you want, wanted to go to a stadium to watch football, as is going on in the Euro 2020, that you have to have vaccines and you have to have essentially uh, a passport. If you want to go into pubs, public places, some of them are requiring it. This is the reality of what will happen because what will happen is at some stage, people are going to get to the point where they will only want to feel or they will only be comfortable associating or being in public places with those who have vaccinations. And like everything in economics, Soon, though, that will be the great majority, and they will dictate what economic forces will do. So bars and restaurants and shops will decide that there are more customers they will get if they implement. So vaccine passports are real. And even in your workplace, people want to say that you, you don't have to be vaccinated. Yes, you have the right not to be vaccinated in your workplace, but your employer has rights too. And I don't mean to get into legal advice or what you do, but you'd be very surprised. Your employer can ask you to produce to him, as I believe some of the company, large one large company at least in Ghana has done, that you have to produce a negative test every two weeks at your own cost. Those are not unreasonable demands because you can't put all your employees at risk if you don't want to be vaccinated then you are at risk. So why should I, you're entitled to your right and you're entitled to your view, but why should everybody be subjected to that? They have their rights and their view too, and it's not yours doesn't supersede theirs. So get vaccinated. So all of that, that is going to happen and all of that, that, is, that will be coming, will not be to your disbenefit. It will not be to your, to your disadvantage. So please, everyone, get vaccinated. Sanjeev, I want to thank you. I, I think we have to wrap things up here. We're, we're almost out of time, but I want us briefly, you know, um, I just want to make mention of one thing before we go on. That is, I have seen 
the sanctimonious gangster has emerged from his palace at Pearl, um, woke up from his slumber, David Granger, and is now out here talking. Could you imagine this guy is telling us that um, the PVC government has um, taken too long to acknowledge and respond to the floods? When ministers, the president himself, would have been on the ground from the get-go, from the very first occasion the floods were reported, this guy who sleeps at 8 o'clock seems to have been in a deep sleep for the last few weeks while um, the government, the PVPC government, was in the fields trying to bring relief to people, to, to protect properties, to protect lives and livelihoods. Granger has emerged from his slumber, trying to reinvent himself um, because I think the PNC, he's getting heavy pushback in the PNC. He's trying to be relevant. He has been irrelevant for the last five years in office and before that he will always remain irrelevant so and i think uh minister Teixeira would have comfortably and clearly answered the stupidity and the ignorance from from from, from this guy who just who just woke up to tell you the truth ed um the first i heard of it that he had that he had made a comment that effectively said the government had been slow in reacting to the flood. I didn't believe it because, A, you don't hear very much from him. He doesn't say very much. He's not seen very much. Um, and so I thought, you know, he, he hasn't really said anything. But then I couldn't, when, I, when I saw what he actually said, and, and it had been confirmed that, yes, he had said so, I thought, clearly, something is wrong in Pearl. And whatever it is, we have to fix it. It's either they have no source of outside communication or they have, which is why we maybe know hear from him, or he has no ability to know what's going on in the rest of the world, or maybe he doesn't care what goes on in the rest of the world. But the reality is the response of the Irfan Ali led administration has been nothing short of spectacular getting everywhere trying to get help trying to get medical supplies food moving people setting up we've heard of the work of the cdc and prime minister mark phillips and and how hard he's worked and what he's organizing and getting help to those that need it to move people to put them in shelters and also to provide them with some form of assistance so that they could survive the floods and re then of course um, we know that once the floodwaters recede, then assistance will be given for, for people to rebuild their lives and rebuild their communities. So I don't know what else he expects or what where he's speaking about that didn't have this. Because the strange thing, Ed, the only time I heard of an, any other thing from the former president was when I received a call from one of my clients that he had sued everybody to say he never said that um, the PNC won the election or APNU won the election. He, he's filed libel proceedings about that, which, which Ed, if it, I, I mean, I don't want to get into very much of it, but these are the last two things the sanctimonious gangsters come out and said. These are the last two things. One, I didn't say I win the election. Two, you didn't do anything sufficient for the flood. I am not sure. We have to fix Pearl. Something is going on in Pearl. They don't get telephone or internet. They don't get communication. Something is wrong in Pearl. <laughs> we have to fix that. I think the guy, David Granger, is senile. That's the reality. And uh, I, I don't know. The guy should stay quiet. He sounds very educated when he's quiet. When Granger is quiet, he sounds very educated and believable. I, that's all I can say. Sanjeev, thanks for joining me. And to our viewers, we want to say thanks for being part of the program. We're going to be back with you soon to continue to have discussions of this nature with you. Until then, we say thanks for watching. Have a good rest of the evening and be careful. Ensure that you get your vaccines.